of my own direction No one can pull me out I force them to run from the others I'm running away now And just like that, we're back at you with another edition of Ring Respect Radio. We are the Video Bros. I'm Bobby Munson, and that man beside me, he's getting this kind of introduction. He is Papa Smokes. Mr. Angelic Voice, how you doing today? Oh yeah, Munson, I'm doing great. How are you doing, and how are all my wrestling people doing out there? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, Papa Smokes, and that's because you have delivered on a great topic here for Ring Respect Radio to kick off 2023 in the right fashion. Uh, but before we get into today's conversation, we're going to ask you to go ahead and click subscribe like it says on the picture. Subscribe, you pencil neck geeks. Whether you're on our local establishment, the Video Bros Network, it doesn't matter. Give us a like, follow, subscribe, and all those kind of things. You guys have been kicking ass out there. And we love you for it. So keep up the great work. Uh, but, you know, before we even get into the main topic of today, I just want to take a quick moment and just send love, prayers, and our thoughts out to the family of Jay Briscoe. What a loss, Papa Smokes. I didn't even want to start to think about doing an episode talking about Jay in full. I think down the line we'll we'll have to do something, but... For today, I just want to take a moment and just send the absolute best to him and his family. Wish his kids a speedy recovery recovery. Cause goddamn man, like it's it's even hard to talk about. Just horrible, sad news in the wrestling world. Yeah, I've also had a cloud over my head since uh, I learned the news yesterday morning. Uh, I guess it was happened the previous night and uh what an awful accident. And my first thought was just, you know, wrestlers driving all the time hitting the road and everything, but I don't think he was traveling no. uh, to do with wrestling because he had his little girls with him, and that's even more tragic that they got injured. But the wrestling uh, world, you know, do, just to talk of, talk of it in terms of wrestling, just lost such a great performer and such a great guy, and uh, we've heard some of the testimonials on Twitter and uh, social media of the people that knew him and worked with uh Jay Briscoe and uh, just the all-around sadness, and I, I have to second my uh, my uh, wishes of condolences and uh, and just the, the sadness that I feel for uh, anybody that passes much too early. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the the horrible, tragic passing again. His uh, daughters were in critical condition. I I hope that they pull out of this as best as possible. You know that there's no way that anything good comes from any of this, but we just hope that, you know, something happens that goes positively and they, you know, recover in some way anyway, because you, you just don't want this to happen to anybody. Yeah. The family needs time and, and it's going to take a lot of time to heal from this, but I hope people respect their privacy and, uh, and send along uh, positive energy and positive vibrations because they need uh, help right now. Yeah, and you know what? We do like to do episodes where we pay tribute to people whose careers that we've lost, and this one's kind of hit all of a sudden. Uh, weren't prepared to start uh, doing one here, and I think that we'll give it time, give it time for the family to to heal a little bit before we start uh, doing our tributes to Jay here on the show. But who we are going to pay tribute to, though, Papa Smokes, uh, is someone that the wrestling industry did lose a while back. But again, somebody that uh, had a very long, very illustrious career and this is why i'm excited about this episode yeah you brought up to uh researching into the career of freddie blassie and of course uh my knowledge of freddie blassie i i was aware he was a wrestler but didn't see much or know much about the wrestling side of it and his career uh more of the managerial side would be where my familiarity with freddie blassie came into play but my eyes are wide open now i've gone i've checked out what i could find for matches and man I, I like the work of Freddie Plassey. I mean, fantastic manager, one of the best in managerial skills, but damn, what a wrestler as well, too. Yeah, and most of us that are still alive these days uh, just remember uh, Plassey from his WWE run or WWF run in the 80s as a manager of such uh, talents as 
Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. He managed them to the tag team title. Uh, Hercules Hernandez, uh, a few other people as well. And uh, he was one of those guys that uh, he was so tight with Vince McMahon Sr. and became tight with Vince McMahon Jr. that they kept him around. They wanted to keep him working as long as they could, and they were going to take care of Blassie because he made them a whole pile of money uh, when he was a wrestler. Yeah, he really did. But to better understand his link to the WWF or WWE as we now know it, let's talk a little bit about his life and what got him there in the first place. Because I, I went digging deep, and again, like you can you can find a lot of great articles online, a lot of things that people have written about Fred Blassie. Uh, there has been very few videos that you'll find on YouTube that go into depth. I believe that uh, Dave from Dave Knows Wrestling and a, a guy that he teamed up with there that did a nice uh, video that talked about the career of Fred Blassie. Of course, uh, Jim Cornette is well known for documenting a lot of the one of the stories he knows about Fred Blassie as well, too, that people could check out, or you could go check out the articles online. But let's start. Uh, so, from youth or before he was was it before he was born or when he was born that his parents immigrated? They were German immigrants that came to the U.S. Uh, fleeing around the time of World War One, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, and coming to uh, the, I'm not sure at first, but I think came right to the California area because. Uh, Blassie was always a big uh, Los Angeles, California man. Yeah, yeah, and again, uh, it came out to the U.S. during that time. Uh, from there, but Fred Blassie would start to get into enjoying seeing pro wrestling, but that's not what his parents wanted for him. Uh, so they wanted to die, kind of <laughs> leaning towards that meat cutting career. If I'm not mistaken, he worked at a butcher shop. They were looking at a meat cutting career, being the path for young Fred Blassie, but he he was an avid. He wanted to get into pro wrestling. Used to sneak into local pro wrestling matches as a young man in order to catch the fights. Well, sometimes you got to do what you got to do too. And if uh, money is scarce and you've got the passion for something, you got to make it happen one way or the other. And uh, this would lead to uh, a lifelong obsession with wrestling with Fred Blassie, uh, especially in the Los Angeles area where uh, We'll talk about uh, at some point here uh, it, at the heights of his career, uh, his tie with the Olympic Auditorium, which we've talked about uh, previously. This this is what got me thinking about this topic, uh, Fred Blassie, is that a month or so ago when we talked about uh, the death of Gene LaBelle and, and his tie with the Olympic Auditorium, I, I was watching some more stuff and reading a bit more stuff after that and... Uh, thought we should talk about Blassie because he's right in on that too. And my head was just in the, in the zone of the Olympic auditorium. Yeah. And again, that it, it couldn't be a better time because it was a fantastic time to be able to learn about this man's career. Um, let's talk a little bit about where he went before he really kind of came. I mean, he started a little bit into pro wrestling. I think that he started going to some of the, the gyms and stuff where the boys were. Uh, he also would uh, go down to the local matches and some of the guys started showing him some of the, some of the locking holds and stuff like that. Some of these submissions and stuff like that, that they were teaching young Fred Blassie at the time. Yeah, and Blassie was already blessed with a, a good, sturdy body, and he was working out and exercising a whole bunch. So again, a lot of us only know him as the older man, but he was quite a striking man as he was when he was younger. He had the good body, the big chest, the big shoulders, and uh, and all that stuff. And uh, he was a handsome dude too. So uh, this led perfectly into wrestling and. Uh, and later on for him uh, into a, a small career in show business as well. Yeah, and quite the career. But uh, <clears throat> even before that, he would actually enlist in the U.S. Navy uh, back around the time of uh, World War II. So again, Fred Blassie, uh, you know, a big thank you for the service that he provided there too. Could be choosing to go over during a time of war to defend his country, uh, get involved there uh, before returning back and really having essentially his first gimmick in professional wrestling, which was to be called uh, Sailor Fred Lassie. Yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, you can imagine him when he's young, fresh-faced with the, the nice physique, the, the tan, the, the combed hair and the nice haircut and everything. Perfect baby face character, Sailor Freddy Blassie, especially with the uh, tie to the U.S. military. Uh, when uh, back at, in the time when all soldiers were uh, thought of a lot more as heroes in society. 
Yeah, but it wasn't really until his heel turn that things really kicked off for him, though, too. That would be around the time of him dyeing his hair bleach blonde, like you mentioned, being the kind of the more Hollywood, the California type. The one that, I mean, that was a gimmick that really stuck back in the day. This is something, you know, like that uh, Buddy Rogers. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of guy that Ric Flair was. These are, these are the kind of guys, they just, they have that arrogance about them, like they're better than you pretty boy type style and that's what drove people insane back in the back in the day for sure and, and gorgeous george being the good example of the there, first yeah. guy that had the uh female scantily clad valet lead him out in the the bedazzled robe and the uh perfume atomizer spraying the little perfume <laughs> and the blonde hair and everything that's of course it's been done a, a thousand million times since then but Back then, that was a little more fresh of a gimmick. And, you know, like, we talk about wrestling getting junky now or or, or fake kind of. The, the Back then, that was probably thought of by, by a lot of wrestlers as a, as a cop-out and a sell-out and a gimmick. And a lot of those guys didn't like that kind of stuff. The, uh, the ultimate wrestlers were thought of as like the Luthez, uh, Jack Briscoe style just shoot grapplers, just trunks, no gimmick, no nothing, and just uh, wrestling skill. But uh, the business was changing and uh, starting to make more money with some more elaborate gimmicks. Yeah, and it uh, it started to pay off. Again, I believe it was at a uh, local carnival that uh, the term Pencil Neck Geek ended up getting used by Freddie Blassie for the very first time. I believe that the gimmick of the other uh, other individual was something along the lines of he was an accountant or something like that. You can elaborate a little bit more, Pop Smokes. But he was he was a pencil pusher, really, a paper pusher of sorts. Yeah, yeah. And as we all know, in the old days of the circuses, uh, uh, the geek used to be the uh, they would have kind of a mentally deranged individual who would do all kinds of weird stunts, and one of the stunts would be to bite the head off the live chicken, and that was the geek, and it just thrilled and disgusted audiences for a long time but you couldn't get a normal guy to do that you had to get someone that was you know not quite all there mentally so uh, it, it was a huge uh, insult and then adding the pencil neck and uh, putting someone's you know physical size into uh, into the insult is just just makes it all that tastier <laughs> yeah and uh Fred Blassie would have inevitably get dubbed a bit of a nickname around this time, too. He started to get dubbed the nickname of the vampire uh, for the fact that he would often bite opponents during his matchups and would be seen in uh, interviews or backstage segments. Uh, you know, he'd be filing his teeth, if I'm not mistaken, down. So it uh, make it look like he's getting them all sharpened up, ready for his next biting victim. Yeah, he had a he had a big money dentist uh, that did all kinds of uh, cosmetic dental surgeries and stuff. And he, he got the guy to ca put caps on his two canine teeth so that he could file them into fangs. And that's, that's some great heel work there. Just biting into the, the opponent's forehead with real sharpened teeth and causing all the blood. So this is another thing is just how weird that was of Blassie's gimmick that he had that kind of Hollywood, um, uh, I'm better than you kind of gimmick going on, but he was also one of the pioneers of, of kind of like, I don't want to say death match wrestling, but the, the bloodier, gorier side of wrestling. And, uh, we'll get to some of his Japanese work later, but he had people, uh, pretty much dropping dead in their seats from some of the mayhem and violence he was causing in his matches. And he got under people's skin so much that they wanted to incite the violence back at him. Blassie would often require police escorts at most of the arenas that he would show up at out of fear for what the fans would do to him. Yeah, it ain't like it used to be. Uh, heels nowadays kind of, it seems like a lot of them craves the love of the fans still, but Blassie's from the time where you had to drive them crazy. You you had to make them hate you so, so badly. You had to make them hate you as badly as you could get them to hate you and fear you. So that's the way he went about it. And, uh, you know, various other wrestlers fit that bill as well, such as the Sheik and Abdullah the Butcher and a number of other guys took that route of, of just being feared and hated. And uh, 
Blassie had that all together too, especially once they called him the vampire and the uh, <clears throat> the rumors of his blood drinking started and everything, which were completely unfounded. But when you get the nickname the vampire, people are going to kind of run with that. Yeah, and all this kind of took place in the time that he was working for uh, Paul Jones. Uh, he would then uh, also, like he originally had worked for Jules Strongbow and then came back in 1960 to begin working once again with Jules Strongbow. Yeah, yeah, because aside from uh, Los Angeles, I think, uh, and New York, I suppose, the WWWF in New York, um, the other biggest place where Blassie got extremely over and extremely popular was Georgia, working for uh, uh, Jay Strongbow. So he had a, a lot of success, both as a babyface and a heel down there, held a couple of the straps and all that stuff. But again, this is, this is even before the... Uh, before the magazines were really covering wrestling and stuff. So there, there isn't that much video or, or even uh, that many pictures from back then. As you notice, trying to research uh, into this, there, there's not nearly enough stuff on Blassie as there should be. Yeah, you'd think you'd have an entire encyclopedia's <clears throat> worth, but it's, it, it is a much deeper dive than one would think. And that's why I, I'm glad we're getting to elaborate on some of this and talk about it and hopefully open the conversation for more people to research it but uh let's uh, is there a little bit more we want to talk about on the on the side of 1960s era jewel strongbow promotion uh, working there with the wwa or did we want to move on to 64 when he finally went over to see Finn senior in the wwwf yeah let's go there i say uh and, and that was a very fruitful time for him too well i mean that's a, that's essentially where he would start feuding with uh, guys like bruno san martino of course one of the best known names that Vin Senior had working for him. And then, of course, Bobo Brazil, again, another person that, you know, we've talked very highly upon. I know that you're a big fan of his well, too, Papa Smokes. Yeah. Uh, so some great feuds that Fred Blassie had there working with Vince McMahon Senior. Yeah, and uh, also the Golden Greek John Tolos, too, who was a huge star out in California and all that, but had some great years working up in New York where they were paying lots of money and the business was doing good. And uh, Blassie had his share of uh, Madison Square Garden main events and uh, other large buildings in the Northeast there. And uh, yeah, just all those, once he got big in LA, all those territories that he went to, he was always a main event guy. He, he never uh, had to do any preliminary stuff, never any of that stuff, because he, uh, he was the complete picture, the complete package as a worker he could not only uh, do the in-ring stuff pretty good, his style, very simple, as you noticed, but uh, completely interactive with the crowd at all times, working them, giving them, you know, what they want and what they don't want all the time in a way to drive them up into a fury of, of hatred towards him. He was a master at it. He sure was. Um so uh, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier, because you're going to start getting close to the managerial times here soon. But again, you mentioned about him going over to Japan, and he had a very notable feud going on there over in Japan as well, too. Uh, in fact, he had uh, quite the time there. Uh, elaborate a little bit more for us on that. And uh, we will take a quick pause here. Uh-oh. Not sure if that's him or that's me. Bob Smokes, you there? There we go. I think I lost right. you for a minute. We're back. <laughs> We're back. Uh, that, that happens, technical difficulties, but uh, we'll continue on. Uh, we were mentioning earlier, uh, you mentioned about uh, Fred Blassie's time over in Japan as well, too, and a notable feud that he had over there. I want you to elaborate for everybody a little bit more about his time over in uh, Japan. For sure. That's probably... Uh... Blassie's most famous ring work, his biggest uh, feud, his most uh, money-drawing feud, and most people watched was against Japanese star. We've talked about him on here before, Ricky Dozen, who was, uh, you know, like the Hulk Hogan or the John Cena or the Steve Austin of Japan during the 60s and 70s, or mostly the 60s, I guess hugely popular star completely over in uh, like we talked about antonio inoki he ricky dozan was the guy before him that was completely uh 
recognizable by everyone that lives in the entire country, whether they're a wrestling fan or not. You know who Ricky Dozen is, and he was thought of as a warrior. And uh, he was, uh, the way they ran their promotion was they liked to have the Western or American or British wrestlers over. And they would have their big star, Ricky Dozan, face one of them. And it was like he was defending their country against the international uh, invaders kind of thing. So uh, when the vampire Blassie came over with the filed teeth and the promo and uh, talking crazy stuff and yelling and uh, the, the interest for this match started to get so huge that they realized we can't just have it live in an arena we have to put it on tv of course at that time this is the pre-cable era you put something on tv it's on the main channel a eh? that's the only thing to watch probably or there might be two or three channels back then but probably only one so it was something like 60 or 80 million people that watched this match it's just it's one of the huge records in wrestling uh, no one could believe that this uh, match was happening and on TV, and it's it, it remains one of the hugest matches in wrestling history by a long shot. Ricky Dozen has another big uh, record as well. One of his matches against the Destroyer, Dick Byer, the Destroyer, you know him, Munson, with the mask. Uh, they had a series, and one of those was on TV as well. Bloody and everything, Dick Byer bleeding from under the mask and everything, but... Uh, putting it on TV and yeah, it's not, they're not battling for 1 million or 2 million or 5 million viewers. They're getting 50, 60, 70 million. It's the whole country watching. Yeah. And big draws too, with the gates and stuff like that too, that were coming in. Oh yeah. Um, when it comes to the wrestling side of Blassie's career, I'm going to put this question over to you. What would you find was his best feuding partner? Who was the best feud for Freddie Blassie, whether it be North America Japan, wherever, which one did you enjoy the most? It's a tough one because there are a bunch of good ones. And in, in, in that L.A. territory, he worked with a bunch of guys, including Bearcat Wright and Bobo Brazil and uh, and uh, John Tolos and so many big stars of the day. Goliath and Gordman were the big uh, tag team out there. And I know Blassie battled them in a number of tag teams, but just because of what we were just talking about, I'd have to say Ricky Dozan just because of the gigantic magnitude of the climactic match was just not a building full of people, but an entire country watching that match. It's it's unprecedented, and I don't think he could have that ever again, but uh, how special that is for wrestling history. Yeah, you bet. Uh, now, not a lot of people in the history of professional wrestling can transition from one role to another and make it work extremely well. It's a it's it's a rare commodity, especially to make it to a point where you're very much known for both sides of it. And Fred Blass, he managed to do this. And the fact that he turned to managerial times. Uh, so Fred Blass, he would go on, I believe it was. I think uh, just going to check my notes around 1974 that he retired from the ring. And that's when he decided to become a manager. Uh, many big names that he uh, managed. Uh, I got a list here. Uh, I want to kind of go through a little bit of this list and just talk about uh, who you thought were some of the ones that really prospered <clears throat> the most under Fred Blassie, uh, starting with, I've uh, got Nikolai Volkov. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we got uh, like a blackjack Mulligan. Uh, High Chief Peter Maivia, Ray Stevens, Adrian Adonis, uh, Jesse the Body Ventura, Dick Murdoch, the Iron Sheik, uh, George the Animal Steel, Hulk Hogan, Mr. Fuji. Uh, is, there's wow. probably more I'm missing here, Bob. So I probably haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah, yeah. There's some of those I forgot as well. And just listen to that list. It's a who's who, including Hulk Hogan, right? Like. Yeah. Like, you think Hulk Hogan wasn't young and learning from Blassie, uh, uh, including that promo style, which which is part of Hogan's bread and butter, too, is having a, a strong promo. And Blassie was the best. He was uh, so comfortable in front of the camera and had been on movie sets and done all kinds of TV, both with wrestling and on TV shows and stuff. He could teach the young guys how to do that and. Blassie had such a strong bond with professional wrestling that he wanted to 
help the younger guys. He, he wasn't one of those gatekeeping kind of guys. He wanted to help the younger guys, but he had to find you worthy first. Yeah, and he found a lot of great people that went on to a lot of great things within the industry. And you see a name like Mr. Fuji. There's another guy that transitioned from being a professional wrestler to what most people nowadays wouldn't realize. That, like They were going to think like me at first. That was a manager. I had no idea of Mr. Fuji's wrestling career prior, much like Fred Blassie, like we're talking about now. Yeah, Fuji was mostly a tag team guy with uh, Professor Tanaka and with Mr. Saito sometimes too. And they were multi-time WWF champions uh, with Blassie and with Lou Al Albano. So, uh, oh yeah, Fu Fuji had a long career, mo mostly known as a tag team guy. Yeah, sure did. Um, so yeah, that uh, the managerial career went on for quite some time, but he even remained with the the WWE, WWF, uh, pretty much from all that time. When he went back to work for the WWF as a manager, he remained as part of the active roster employed by the WWF right up until his passing, if I'm not mistaken, was inducted into their Hall of Fame like he's in everybody's Hall of Fame, I'm sure of it. I, I don't follow closely enough. I'm sure he's in the Observer Hall of Fame and every possible I'm Hall sure. of Fame. I'm sure he, at one point in time, he's got to be in some sort of Hollywood Hall of Fame too because he, he expanded out past professional wrestling. He was one of the ones that really took it and went for it outside of there and really you know, trailblazed for a lot of the guys who would go into the entertainment side of things outside of professional wrestling. For sure. And like Gene LaBelle, when we talked about him, he had grown up in the in the Los Angeles area that's that's focused on filmmaking and, and television and all that stuff. So um, just like LaBelle, Lassie was like a good wrestler and all that stuff, but he was more than that. He had the he had the whole package, he had the whole personality and the presentation and the star power. That's why I say he, he was never a mid-card guy. He was always a top guy because everyone wanted to, you know, brush up against him and get some of his skill and talent onto them kind of thing. And you wanted a match with this guy. And, uh, yeah, he, he was in a whole bunch of movies. He's in the show Happy Days. I remember that. You know that show. Yeah, uh, of course. He, he, and he's a, he's a tough wrestler in that in that movie. Same thing as, uh, or sorry, in that TV show, same thing as Gene LaBelle. Often if uh, Hollywood needed a tough guy, a gang leader, a wrestler, a boxer, some sort of tough dude that fights in their movie, they might go and get a professional wrestler because then that guy can do his own stunts or do his own bumps, so to speak, and can be worked with easily for uh, fight choreography and stuff too. And I want to, if I'm not mistaken, he's also in the uh, music video that Sidney Lauper put out that pretty much features the entire yeah. cast of the WWF at the time. Yeah, yeah, he's in that too. And uh, one one little tidbit I wanted to add about him transitioning from wrestler to manager is it wasn't completely a, a decision he made. Uh, Blassie had decided to go up and work for the McMahons uh, in New York uh, in did you say it was 1974 or five? And, uh, uh, 74 and it, is when he retired. It was actually 64 when he went to go work for Vince senior. Yeah. Yeah. That was just it. He went up there to, he wanted to wrestle still, but in the state of New York at that time, when they were still regulated by, uh, sports commissions, you, uh, it wasn't allowed. You couldn't get a wrestler's license after the age 55 or something like that, just for the, you know, for the insurance or health risks or whatever. So uh, they didn't have that in other states, but New York had that. So Blassie foiled in his attempt to keep wrestling. Uh, he he was more or less forced to transition into a managerial role. It's funny to think that a guy <clears throat> at that age was forced into choosing not to wrestle again. Yeah. You're talking about a tough guy right there. If I was that age, I know I sure as hell wouldn't feel like uh, getting in there and bumping around with tough guys myself. For sure, but you know we're not Freddie Blassie. He he lived no. the whole <laughs> life of that, and uh, he had the passion for the business. And uh, I don't think anybody screwed with Blassie. I mean, he was he was well liked and and a tough guy too. And uh, uh, there's you know there's talk about his uh, 
private life too, which I don't really like to get into too much because it's none of our business, but he was a ladies man. He always had uh, women around. He was always married, but always had women on the road and stuff. Had two wives at one point, you know, like had a Japanese wife and a, and a U.S. wife because he was traveling all the time. He's a practical dude, right? You need your stuff <laughs> with you, I suppose. And, uh, and I, I also think he was uh, typical of a pro wrestler. It, you know, the, when we compared him to like a Ric Flair is he lived wrestling. He was always on the road. So his kids barely know him kind of thing. And I don't think the kids liked him that much. I think his one kid kind of didn't want anything to do with him, but the one kid was a fan of him as a wrestler kind of too. So like that was their bond is that he only really liked him because he thought he was such a talented wrestler. But these are the, you know, the prices that people pay, I suppose, when you, you want to be a, professional wrestler live your life on the road traveling living out of a suitcase living in hotels and stuff if you have a family at home that's difficult right i mean people do manage to have both but sometimes it's it's a difficult situation uh, like they say it doesn't matter the maker model of the vehicle eventually they all need an oil change <laughs> it yeah. goes without saying but uh, anything else you wanted to touch on on Fred Blassie's wrestling career, his managerial career, anything, any last thoughts that you got here, Pop Smokes, for everybody? No, not really. Just that um, I, that's one guy that I'm glad that Vince Senior, sorry, Vince Junior, the the Vince McMahon we know, um, recognized the value in. Uh, I think the two got along very well, so that helped. Vince Senior would have told Junior, "Hey, Blassie's one of our guys. We take care of him." till he dies kind of thing. He's always got a job here till he dies. Same thing with Gorilla Monsoon and Blackjack Lands and a bunch of other, uh, uh, well, Gerald Briscoe at one point, but I guess he got fired <laughs> from his job. He, he didn't get it uh, right till the end, but uh, there were a bunch of those guys that Vince Sr. said, hey, once I'm gone, you got to take care of these guys till they die. And Blassie was one of those. And I'm I'm glad that the the, uh, the younger generation of viewers got to see him as the manager still, but still getting that that uh, sharp wit in his promos and the insults and the uh, uh, the Hollywood fashion plate outfits and the rhinestone jackets and the slacks and the cane and everything. What a guy! What a character! And uh, uh, he transcended various uh, generations up to the. One when we were kids, when we saw him as a manager on TV. You bet. And, you know, I heard you mention Rhinestone there, Pop Smokes. And uh, before we get to where people can find us, I'm going to tell you where you can find us. And that's on Saturday, Saturday, February the 18th, live in Saskatoon. Pop Smokes and I are going to be down at ringside. The video bros taping all the action. And I say Rhinestones because Rhinestone Cowboy is one of the very many people that's going to be joining us live in action that day. We're also <clears> going to have a cruiserweight match. It is going to be the son of Irish taking on Tony Novak. And in our main event to the evening, it is going to be a tag team match. It's going to be the team of LS Cino and the champion, Sheikak Bar Shabazz. They're going to be taking on the team of the Kellys, Cannonball Kelly and Colton Kelly. And guess what? There is a stipulation PPW management put on this one. If Colton Kelly or Cannonball Kelly happen to get the, if either one of those men get the pinfall on the champion, Sheik Akbar Shabazz in that main event, they will then become the new number one contender to the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship. You don't want to miss it. Get your ticket for Love is Dead, presented by Prairie Pro Wrestling. Saturday, February 18th, live in Saskatoon. Papa Smokes, I'm turning it over to you. Where can people reach out to you? Where can they find you coming up in the upcoming weeks? I am on Elon Musk's free speech wonderland and theme park known as Twitter. I'm at Smokes underscore Papa. And on Twitch, you can find me at Papa underscore Smokes underscore. That's fantastic. And as always... We got lots of things going on here in our local establishment. There is everywhere where you can reach out to us, follow, like, and subscribe. You're probably also watching here on the Video Bros Network. And if you are doing so, we appreciate the subscription as well, too. Everything you can do to help us out. And as always, you want to help us pay the bills, head on over to see our friends at Rogue Energy, where you can use the promo code OLE Pods for 10% off your order. But that is for it for us. In the meantime and in between time, check out all the other work that Papa Smokes and I have. 
here on our local establishment or Saturdays at Prairie Pro Wrestling. We will see you guys very soon. Take care.